we're very excited to welcome the relatively new arts director for the British Council. Graham, is, as our speaker today, is also responsible for leading and developing global arts programs over the Council's 110 country operation. Um, I can tell you that uh, Graham has been the go-to guy for visioning and arts policy around the world. When uh, Rahm Emanuel was elected mayor of Chicago, one of the first people he called to consult on that city's cultural plan was Graham. Our colleague festival up the road in Toronto, Luminato, was founded six years ago uh, with Graham's assistance and vision. He has an extensive biography that I hope you all take the time to read. But without any further delay, I'd like you to welcome Graham Sheffield. Oops. Just remember to turn, turn the microphone on. There we are. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cece and, and Mary Lou, for those very warm words. And it's a great privilege and honor to be invited to this festival, which I've long admired uh, as one of the best uh, and most um, thoughtful, as well as inspiring festivals in, this, in the Americas. So thank you for asking me. And it uh, feels like home here in the Yale Center for British Art, uh, sort of seeing pictures of the Queen um, up in the gift shop, as well as some uh, memorabilia and uh, souvenirs. Um, anyway, it's great. Thank you for inviting me. And I do uh, urge you, as uh, Mary Lou has said, to get your tickets for Prudencia Heart. Um, it was a great show. I saw it at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival last year, and I'm going again tonight. And part of the attraction is you can drink single malt whiskey throughout the performance. And I think that's a, a very good way of audience building for theatre performances in general, actually. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes with some pictures and so on, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion. So I hope some of the issues I raise will, will spark off a, a, a good debate. Um, last month, the British Council launched over 120 films online in partnership with Google and the British Film Institute. They were short documentaries made in the 1930s and 40s about Britain as it then was. For the last 30 years, this remarkable collection of films has been preserved in the BFI National Archive, but it's rarely been shown. Um, the objective then was to showcase Britain to the outside world, particularly the empire and the colonial territories at a time of growing fascism in Europe and later of world war. So let's enjoy just a brief taster of what some of those films illustrated. Britain, the United Kingdom, an island 700 miles long, 200 miles wide, separated from Europe by the English Channel. Making knives is still a job that requires the skill of the individual worker. Back among the clatter of the looms, you'll find our Edna and our Annie. They say they get used to the noise and manage to talk by lip reading. All guns reported ready, the captain gives the order to open fire. danger has arisen a great citizen army, the Home Guard. Clerks, factory hands, bank managers are trained in the very streets they may one day have to defend.
This machine helps the cripples' first attempts to walk, and these exercises strengthen backs and legs. Well, there's not much more to tell you. You've seen how we look and how we work. Ah, yes, how we play. youngsters, whose heroes are the famous professional footballers, and who dream of the day when they too perhaps may hear the roar of the crowd. He's pushing it right through now, Golden through to Rook, Rook's on the oblique angle and he shoots into the net. A beautiful goal there by Rook. Afternoon draws to a close and the classrooms begin to empty. Five million British children are going home to tea. <laughs> They're wonderful films, those. Um, you can see from just that trailer compilation of, of the films, and I do recommend you go online to our website, British Council, and look around for British Council Film Collection. There's some real gems there about sports, about London, about the police force, the railways, even about rabbits. Don't, <laughs> don't ask me why, I couldn't resist putting that in. There's a film about the development of the rabbit made in 1944, while Britain and France have, you know, the whole of Europe was at war, and what was the British Council doing making a film about rabbits? <laughs> um, the view presented in a lot of these films is unequivocally utopian. It was a morale booster, demonstrating the strength and integrity of the British way of life, the British stiff upper lip and resolve triumphing over adversity. To our, to our eyes and ears, in some of the films, there's more than a whiff of Orwell's 1984 or Huxley's Brave New World. A unilateral, uniform, conformist, bourgeois Britain, a singular monoculture, a stable, homogeneous society, all singing from the same hymn sheet. But of course, these films have to be seen in the context of the time, not that long ago, in fact, well within the lifespan of our parents. In an era of social uncertainty, inequality, political extremism, instability, economic turmoil, recession, war, rapid industrial change, and intolerance. Hang on a minute, you'll say. That's what we're in right now, isn't it? Um, many of those ills of those decades are sadly still with us. I don't need to rehearse them with you, but added to those mentioned, many of the institutions and professions which we've held in respect in the UK and elsewhere for so long are now critically devalued. The culture of politics. I think that goes for both sides of the Atlantic in my observation. The culture and practice of journalism the absence of an ethical code, all the phone hacking we've had, the mindless worship of celebrity, the profession of banking, the challenges facing our education and examination systems, and even the integrity of that pillar of the UK establishment, our police force, is more under scrutiny than any time in the last 50 years. You could argue that almost the only culture in the UK is still strong in its self-belief, its values, its contribution to society, and its integrity is the culture of culture. That's to say, the arts and the creative industries. And I think the release of these vintage films has struck an extraordinary chord in the UK, online and in the social media. We've had nearly half a million viewings in the first month. And I believe the resonance for our day is not one of sepia-tinted nostalgia, but more a catalyst to examining how we saw ourselves 70 years ago and how we see ourselves now, how we engaged with the world then in cultural relations and how we do so now. The British Council, founded in 1934, it was set up as the UK's 
cultural relations organization to build bridges across the world in terms of understanding and appreciation of the UK, to promote the UK's interests. And one of the means of doing this was through the arts. Now, the arts have always been part of the British Council's cultural relations mission, alongside our other two pillars, English and exams, and education and society. But recently, I'm glad to say, they've been given a much more prominent role, and that's why, after almost 35 years in the arts and broadcasting, I decided a year ago to take on this massive job of British Council's Global Director Arts, to use my experience in the arts uh, in a new context for me of cultural relations and cultural diplomacy. Before I go any further, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to define what the British Council is. I was asked this at lunch, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very unclear um, to some people, even to uh, a lot of people in the UK. So many people don't understand what we do, confuse us with other organisations, or think we're just there to give grants, or a combination of all of those. And because most of the impact of our work is outside the UK, we're much less well understood at home than in, say, India or Spain. This has made our profile in the UK at best opaque, um, not very good for attracting or retaining government money or sponsors. In fact, I wonder how many of you in this audience know exactly what we do. So the British Council is the United Kingdom's International Organization for Cultural Relations. But what exactly do we mean by cultural relations? Well, we believe it's about building trust between people from different cultures by creating international opportunities and exchanging knowledge and ideas. We're a registered charity and operate under royal charter with the Queen as our patron. The Foreign Office gives us money towards our work overseas. But for every pound we get from the Foreign Office, we more than double it from uh, our own uh, uh, commercial operations, teaching English, running exams, and delivering educational and development contracts around the world. For more than 75 years, our work has helped grow the UK's appeal by attracting other countries to the values and opportunities the UK represents. At the same time, the international links we create have allowed people in the UK to build lasting relationships all over the world and learn from other cultures. So in very general terms, we're looking to achieve four things. English, widespread and better quality teaching and learning of English worldwide. Another major part of what we do is delivering UK examinations overseas. Our exam business is self-funding and generates £50 million a year for UK exam boards for the exams that we administer. We also co-own something called IELTS, which stands for International English Language Testing System. It's the world's leading English test. Secondly, we're looking for new ways of connecting with each other through the arts, with the best of contemporary UK music, visual arts, literature, theatre, film, fashion, design, architecture. Of course, some of our projects also look to the UK's cultural heritage for inspiration. The third thing we're looking to achieve is greater UK leadership of international education and shared learning around this. An example is our Going Global Conference, one of the world's largest international education conferences, which brings together industry leaders and policymakers to discuss key higher education and skills issues. And we also promote the UK as an attractive destination for international students. And finally, we aim for stronger societies and institutions in the UK and worldwide. And we do this through programs like Active Citizens, where we develop community leaders, enabling them to respond to local and global issues and really make a difference. The British Council has always worked with countries across the economic spectrum, as well as those coming into or out of conflict, where cultural relations can play an essential role in rebuilding society and in economic development. Our portfolio is intended to work together, a kind of mixed model of public and earned income, of charitable purpose and value, as well as commercial and entrepreneurial gain, one cross-subsidizing the other. In the old days, it was very much more of the charitable purpose than the commercial, but of course, like everywhere else, the grant in aid, in our case from the Foreign Office, your equivalent would, I imagine, be the State Department, has been eroded to the extent that we are no more than 25% publicly funded and falling. The ratio is significant when it comes to our relationship to and with government, 
They are inclined on occasion to think they still own us, even though they're now far from being a majority stakeholder. By contrast, on most occasions, we do wish to align ourselves with broad UK objectives, whilst we reserve the right to challenge and question some of the political dogmas. It's amusing to read the dust jacket of a book written in 1984, significant, to celebrate the first 50 years of the British Council. I picked it up last Christmas at a British Council staff jumble sale for $3. Um, I quote, it is an autonomous body, yet one of the strongest arms of this country's diplomacy. It's a strange fact that although the council has devoted friends in most countries of the world, many people in Britain have no clear idea of what it does or what it stands for. The roots of this odd situation, a masterly British understatement, are revealed in the history of the council itself, a history fascinating for what it reveals about Britain's apparent indifference towards projecting its own national culture. Interesting that comment about projecting its own national culture, because you might say that's exactly what those films were doing, the trailer we saw earlier. But I guess the author Francis Donaldson didn't know they existed. What's interesting to me is that word projected. In the early days, cultural relations in, through the arts was something we did to people. Here's how we do it, Shakespeare, music, art. You do something similar, and you might be as good as we are in Britain sometime. Nowadays, we do cultural relations not to people, but with people. Our whole purpose, and one I've emphasized strongly since my arrival, is one of mutuality, of sharing experience and creativity, and of dialogue. This is the nature of the arts in a global society. Artists hungry to share their inspiration, their ideas, audiences eager to see and experience collaborative work and work that crosses cultural, ethnic, artistic boundaries. This is how we work, while at the same time mindful of our duty to support international and exposure and opportunity to the UK arts sector. It's often argued that the history of cultural diplomacy is a long one. I rather disagree. Um, as we now understand it, I think the history really goes back only as far as the 1930s when the British Council was set up. And we were way behind many of our European friends in seeing the opportunities of culture within the diplomatic portfolio bag. In earlier times, I believe it was much more about emblems of power, a glorification of state, the church, or other religions as they showcase their supremacy, asserting their presence through the arts, magnificent buildings and lavish spectacle, the exchange of gifts and art as a means of diplomatic rapprochement or trade agreements. It wasn't about understanding, it wasn't about learning, and it was certainly not done in a spirit of humility. That was about power, um, a mighty beast displaying its finery in an attempt to mar mark out its own patch. And it was often backed by armies, military strength, and a predatory appetite for trade and commerce. This is a generalization, but I think it's a fair one. In the years immediately after World War II, the ch tone changed, certainly in the Europe, with the birth of two major festivals in, Salz in Ed Avignon and Edinburgh and the rebirth of the Salzburg Festival. Um, these were cast or recast in the roles of reconciliation, of models of intercultural dialogue, of building trust and mutual understanding through the arts and cultural exchange, very close indeed to the Council's own mission. But you can see how and why that modish term, soft power, is so often banded about, because it implies power over some, someone else or another nation, but without the use of military force. I contend the term soft power is actually wholly inappropriate for the work we do, and that there's a massive job for education for our political and diplomatic classes in understanding that what we're about in the arts and cultural relations is emphatically not soft, and nor is it about power. Why is it not soft? Because the arts transform lives, they build character, they enrich our societies, they unlock the imagination, they, they create jobs and prosperity, in short, and whatever your tastes are, they frankly make our existence worthwhile. As British Museum Director Neil McGregor has demonstrated in his History of the World in 100 Objects, human history is told most strikingly through the arts, design, and culture. Of course, it's also told through war and conflict, but the arts and artists are what we cherish and remember. If it's not soft, why is it not about power? 
Because what we all do now in the arts is seek to unlock our own creativity, to share our ideas, to be inspired, and to learn from one another. At its most assertive, this is about influence, but never ever about power. You are not seeking to take anyone over. You're seeking to gain traction or credibility over an idea, a concept, a theme, not to govern. The value to, all, to us all with this approach is that we understand one another better, we trust one another, and the world, in theory, becomes more secure, more tolerant, and more prosperous as a result. The rapid pace of change in the Middle East has given us all ample chance to put this theory into practice, even though the current tragic state of Syria makes it impossible even for the arts to gain a foothold there. The UN, the Arab League, even the might of China and Russia are impotent in the face of that disaster, let alone the US. But when and not if the situation improves, what will be first back in apart from medical aid? It will be the NGOs, moves to regenerate and rebuild society. And I bet you the arts and artists will be near the front of that movement, if not at the front. In the wake of the Arab Spring, we, the British Council, responded across the region from North Africa through the Levant to the Gulf by injecting funding to open up artistic opportunity and training, in particular to young people. A grant scheme we set up for young Egyptian artists to come to the UK. We ran film writing workshops with the Institut Francais and the British Film School in the region. And we're trying to find ways of exporting British skills in technical training for theater and dance, as well as for museum and curatorial management, much in demand wherever we work. When the Gaddafi regime fell in Libya, our office had been closed for a while. We taught English there, but we were soon open again. And our small staff in Tripoli approached me and said what we might do to give the newly liberated people in Tripoli, as well as in Benghazi, a signal of hope and of reconnection to the outside world through the arts. What would be appropriate for the UK to offer? What would the people want? Who was interested? The response overwhelmingly was that young people were eager to experience popular music from the UK. And there was a huge movement of people engaged in street art, graffiti of all kinds, people just out able to express themselves in the streets, which would have been forbidden in Gaddafi's time. So we planned a live concert of UK and Libyan artists to coincide with the start of our UK's popular music show, Selector, produced by the council, which is syndicated to 36 countries globally. This is a kind of radio program about British music and currently reaches 3 million people a week worldwide. In the event, the security situation was too fragile for the concert, but the radio program is now launched there. I spoke, too, to the new director of the Victorian Albert Museum, a visionary and enlightened German called Martin Roth. There he is. Um, who understands the purpose and rationale for the British Council, many of them most British, better than most British people, in fact. It happened that he had an exhibition of street art in his international touring portfolio, ready to go. So it went. And we were able to show this both in Tripoli and Benghazi this year in February, around the time of the first anniversary of the start of the uprising. The Times of London wrote, it was the first exhibition supported by any international museum in the country since the overthrow. The Libyan version was put together in an amazing six weeks, a fraction of the time usually required for a major exhibition, and featured work by global street art stars such as Banksy and Shepard Fairey, alongside equally billed thrilling examples by Libyan artists. There, I think you've got just one example. Successful though these initiatives are, it's important to see this cultural diplomacy, or rather I see it as diplomatic culture, is a nice distinction, as part of a long-term engagement, certainly by us. So only a day after that opening in Tripoli, I and senior colleagues met the Libyan Minister of Culture and a delegation in London. Only two months after they'd come to power, they were looking at their cultural future, rebuilding civil society, education and the arts, and they had come to us for help. Help with building and running a ministry, help with English teaching, help with fostering a new spirit of openness, help to foster a spirit of free debate, basic things that we're privileged to be able to take for granted, but which we hope will transform Libyan society. Of course we'll help. Our motivation, well, it's certainly not power, 
It's not commercial gain. No, we do make some money from English and exams there. But we believe it's in all our interests that Libya moves towards being a stable and prosperous and just society, exploiting its rich cultural heritage and its creatively impatient youth. That's the value back to the UK. And frankly, the United States also, and all the rest of Western and Eastern civilization. So you can see we work in many different ways, high profile public events and behind the scenes on the creative future, infrastructure, skills, knowledge, policy and training. All of it with determination and long term purpose, far from short term opportunism of so many of our political masters these days. Elsewhere in the region, we're working in Iraq, a literary festival in Erbil, a national youth orchestra in Baghdad in partnership with the Scottish authorities, and in culturally restricted Saudi Arabia. In the Gulf, we found a new way to express mutuality and find a common purpose, to showcase but in a bilateral way. Now, as you know, representational painting presents issues in Muslim society, but we have as, our, uh, as part of our estate a fabulous collection of contemporary British art built up over the years from gifts and purchases, over eight and a half thousand works valued at nearly 100 million pounds. In bad times, it's sometimes been seen as irrelevant, but now in our newly re-enlightened leadership, we all see it as a major player in our cultural relations game. The pictures you've just seen were some of the uh, opening of uh, the, an exhibition in Riyadh. Now the collection is much in demand from British Council overseas for exhibitions and is now fully digitized and online. And in Riyadh we put together a show called Out of Britain, a series of British landscapes from the last 50 years, not a mild managed show by any means, with some dark and searching imagery from the collection, exploring the themes of landscape from the literary Britain of Bill Brandt to a new installation by Conrad Shawcross. The unusual feature is that we haven't curated it ourselves. We invited a Saudi curator to reinterpret this British work. The process then becomes one of sharing and mutual learning rather than a projection of the UK as you might see in certain marketing campaigns. Similarly, we're playing a major role in the Cultural Olympiad in London's Festival 2012, now in full swing across the UK. We're supporting uh, UK movie collaborations from artists from each, music collaborations with artists from each of the continents. For example, the Colombian Frente Cumbiero jamming with British muse musicians in a wild free weekend of music down the Thames in mid-July. We're involved in Unlimited, a festival of disability arts, a very sophisticated and advanced sector in the UK and one which colleagues in China and Brazil are particularly interested to learn from and develop. And then, of course, there's Shakespeare. Not content with just doing Shakespeare as we know it in the UK, the Royal Shakespeare Company in the Globe have masterminded an extraordinary extravaganza of Shakespeare. New productions by the RSC in partnership with countries overseas, as well as Globe to Globe, which is a marathon series of some 37 different Shakespeare productions in 37 different languages over six weeks. Um, this, I believe, is not only an extraordinary artistic achievement, but something the UK can be proud of in terms of opening up our own culture and heritage to multiple interpretation from multiple countries. Shakespeare's for the world, its themes, its characters, its stories, resonant wherever you choose to set them. We couldn't support them all from the council, but we have helped to bring to London Romeo and Juliet from Iraq, Midsummer Night's Dream for Russia, Macbeth from Tunisia, Richard III from Brazil, amongst others. That was especially memorable to me because as so many Brazilian shows uh, I've seen in my life, um, within five minutes the entire cast had all their kit off and were dancing around the stage naked, so you knew it was from Brazil. <laughs> and at the Globe, I've seen Cymbeline in Juban Arabic from the world's newest nation, troubled South Sudan. I saw Taming of the Shrew in Urdu from Lahore in Pakistan. I saw it there in Lahore in rehearsal in February. And only two weeks ago, this production of Comedy of Errors from Ray E. Sabs, which means Path of Hope, a company performing in Dari Persian from Kabul, Afghanistan. 
Now, a few months ago, I spoke at a cultural diplomacy conference in Abu Dhabi at their festival there alongside the US ambassador to the Emirates, Michael Corbyn. I guess I ought not to have been surprised at this distinguished diplomat with 20 years of service in the region, but I was. His central, but in a good way, his central theme was that his country, your country, needed to raise its game in terms of cultural diplomacy and basically change the narrative. I paraphrase, but only slightly. He remarked that people across the region, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, thought of the US simply and only in terms of its military, and that he personally would like to see a very different story emerging, one that focused on the vibrancy and creativity of US culture in its diversity and its entrepreneurial spirit. All I can say is over to you guys and girls, and maybe senior Washington elite should pay more heed to the advice of its senior diplomats, because I keep hearing how so much of your public diplomacy money used in the arts in years gone has now been dismembered or disbanded, and anyway, it's not what it was, but I hear signs of hope from one or two colleagues here. We, uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, we in the UK are almost as tainted as, as you are. After all, we were there 150 years before and we didn't succeed then either. Um, however, we have been working hard on the ground in recent years there with major projects in education, building civil society, English language teaching, particularly through teaching the teachers, cultural leadership for their museums and institutions, and also with the Afghan National Music Institute. Part of this endeavor is really to stimulate Afghan creative expression and to help broaden and improve the image of Afghanistan overseas, changing the narrative, as well as gently but firmly trying to tackle gender issues such as women's rights. That's why we helped initiate this extraordinary production of Shakespeare's early comedy. We'd worked with Ray Isabs in 2005, soon after they were founded by the very dynamic Corinne Jabert, a director strongly influenced by the legendary Peter Brook. Then the play was Love's Labour's Lost. So when she approached our country director, Paul Smith, and The Globe with the idea of Comedy of Errors for the Globe to Globe Festival, everyone wanted to help. Then, on the 20th of August 2011, a round of rehearsals uh, for the show was due to commence in the garden of the British Council compound in Kabul. The day before, suicide bombers attacked the council in an eight-hour gun battle which left 14 people dead and the compound completely destroyed. The pictures, as you can see, were vivid and quite terrifying. Our country director said at the time, I quote, even the work of cultural and educational relations can arouse hostility in today's Afghanistan. But the work of the British Council continues to help the Afghan people strengthen their national security, cultural identity, and eventually prosperity. So we moved rehearsals to Bangalore in India, and finally the show came to London before it tours elsewhere in the UK and mainland Europe. And one can only hope they're able to play at some point in Kabul without suffering threats, as the company did back in 2005. This is certainly cultural relations on the front line. As for Paul Smith, our country director, he leaves Kabul next month and has been appointed our new country director here in the United States, where I'm sure he'll do a great job. Um, incidentally, we're already strengthening our arts team and our work here in the US over the coming years, um, even though, of course, the focus and objective is somewhat different from that in Kabul. So do please give uh, Paul, when he comes, a friendlier welcome than he got in Kabul from the Taliban. I'm sure you will. Um, different also is Russia. Now, cultural relations um, were very far from their mind when they invaded Afghanistan in the 1970s, uh, nor, as I've said, it, was it in ours when the Western coalition followed in the wake of 9-11. United Kingdom and Russian cultural relations have never been particularly easy. We used to have 13 centers in Russia, stretching from Sochi in the south to yuzhno sakhalinsk plus offices in Moscow and St. Petersburg. But in 2007, our operations were cut back after an edict from the Russian government. The Supreme Arbitration Court subsequently rejected the claim made by the Russian tax authorities uh, about the British Council, but still, since then we've only retained a physical presence in Moscow, so we were virtually shut down. But in the last two years, things have been inching forward. 
But with Russia, it always seems to be like a poker game, or at best, a game of culturally diplomatic chess, where each move carries a hidden meaning. Then, last July, following a Russia focus at the London Book Fair, where the Russian ambassador turned up, the first appearance by a senior Russian official at a cultural event in the UK for several years, things began to move faster. Um, so, in political and diplomatic relations, as I've said, haven't been smooth, but in recent months, the arts and the British Council have demonstrably played a major role in improving the atmosphere between our countries. The Yuri Gagarin statue, which was unveiled outside our offices last summer, uh, it's still there, it'll be moved on back to Greenwich, I think it's going down to Greenwich, as well as the Russia focus at the Book Fair in 2011. But also, recent art shows by Anthony Gormley in St. Petersburg and on William Blake in Moscow. All of these have been extraordinary arts events, but also achievements in terms of cultural relations. They provide a space for discussion of common interests and aspiration, space which the arts can prepare for the politicians. As evidenced at the bilateral meeting last year, when President, then President Medvedev told Prime Minister David Cameron, we have lots of good artistic examples to our cooperation between Russia and the UK. Subsequently in Moscow, we opened a major show by Henry Moore in the Kremlin, the first ever modern art exhibition to be shown at the Kremlin Art Galleries, and then Reconstruction, a UK fashion show featuring Vivian Westwood and Paul Smith, among others. Later this year will come Brit Lit, bringing British literature to Russian classrooms, and a new British film festival, now in its 11th edition, and a massive part of film culture across Russia, and an extended program of UK theatre in Russia, including a collaboration between the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Chekhov International Festival. And a couple of weeks ago only, I think we achieved something of a breakthrough when our Foreign Secretary, William Haig, and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, met in Moscow. Amongst the outcomes were a joint announcement of a Russia-UK year of culture and language in both countries in 2014. And this presents us with a huge opportunity to cement and build on our progress to date, as well as deliver a superb arts and cultural relations program. Set against that is Vladimir Putin's almost simultaneous announcement that he wouldn't be coming to London for the Olympics, which in the circumstances of this Russia-UK protocol could be interpreted as something of a snub. So it's two steps forward, one step back, pawn to king four, whatever you like to call it. So you can see from this story that cultural diplomacy with the Russians is a highly politicized affair. Big gestures are in play, big institutional moves. The territory is much more old fashioned with large arts exhibitions and theater projects being played as bargaining tools or gambling chips. Um, we are often closer to the Foreign Office and the Embassy than is ideal or that we or they would like. But given the Russian style of play, I think there it's almost inevitable. This relationship with our own government is a constant source of interest. As I've intimated, we're at arm's length from the government and the Foreign Office, not dissimilar to the relationship between Arts Council England and the Governmental Department of Culture, Media and Support, and indeed the BBC. Quasi-independent operations, but with some degree of public finance and responsibility to go with it. It leaves both sides with wiggle room, or call it flexibility of interpretation, if you like. In some countries, we co-locate with the embassy, often for valid security or cost reasons, but that does raise eyebrows amongst the sceptical when we have to insist that we're a separate organisation, which we emphatically are. There are tensions, of course, but the best relationships occur when the ambassador in whatever country has a grown-up relationship with our country director and each knows the limits of his or her remit and the space for negotiation and compromise. It doesn't always happen, unfortunately. But there's much that is uncontroversial. Our work in English exams, teaching and civil society. 
But the arts are often controversial, occupying space which challenges ideas, opinions, prejudices, and societal norms. And it's often struck me as ironic that governments always call for the arts whenever they can't think of anything else to do. Uh, we need an initiative now, so let's have a cultural agreement or festival. And yet the artists themselves will often be critical of those same politicians or policies. So the arts are not well behaved in general, nor should they be. However, the good thing that in, is in cultural relations in the arts, we can often preoccupy intellectual space the politicians cannot inhabit. We're a kind of cultural John the Baptist, only hopefully without the decapitational consequences here depicted by Caravaggio, sadly not in our British Council collection. Um, this space, um, I use this as a metaphor, often takes us into dangerous territory freedom of expression issues, cultural sensitivities, lobby groups calling for boycotts. But if we are to be a strong and effective organization, it's important, I believe, to hold robust, well-argued positions on all of these issues. But this will inevitably mean some disagreement with us. I'm okay with this. We are, I think, all as an organization comfortable with occasionally being uncomfortable. That's our job. Take the instance of China. In 2012, but in the planning for three years, we're leading a large-scale season in China. Hundreds of events in 17 cities over eight months. It's called UK Now in China. It's the largest season ever of British arts and culture there. There's a British arts event somewhere in China every day between April and the end of November. And it's all underpinned by four major training programs for arts professionals in leadership, policy, technical skills, and heritage. These days, the British Council doesn't pay for everything. We'll put in seed funding, investment. We seek major supporting sponsors. We'll underwrite the training programs, and we support the whole affair with website, marketing, and communications. It's very much more of a partnership uh, than we used to be able to operate with much larger funding. Given the current issues over freedom of speech, over the imprisonment of the artist Ai Weiwei and the general stiffening of approach by the Chinese authorities in terms of handling some of the most eminent authors, it's surprising there hasn't been more debate about our overall engagement with the Chinese. There was, however, a major controversy over our engagement with China in terms of the annual London Book Fair. The focus this year was on China. We have an annual partnership with the Book Fair, which mixes opportunities for the trade and publishers, translation opportunities, exposure for new writers, and so forth, with a healthy diet of debate. Now, the literary world is far more politically active than almost any other sector of the arts, but there was a strong body of opinion within the profession that felt that we should not have engaged with China because of its treatment of certain writers and its attitude to censorship. We take a very different view that engagement, even with those with whom you disagree, is important, that having those debates in the open demonstrates to the other side the strength and value of democratic debate, and that the road to a new level of personal freedoms, not only in China but elsewhere also, is not necessarily a straight one. You sometimes, to use a sailing metaphor, have to tack from side to side in order finally to cross the line. We are absolutely and unequivocally for engagement, for a long-term approach to issues such as these, and are resolutely opposed to the boycott game. I won't go into the details of the China affair here, but we played a pretty resolute hand in a difficult environment. Everyone knows the Chinese are not the easiest of partners, but you just have to keep plugging away, whether you're in trade, business, or cultural relations. In my view, isolation is not a real option, and if you look at the totality of growth and progress in our overall arts and culture program with China, and theirs with us, even the most ardent skeptic would have to admit we've made major progress. There's been an interesting example, though, in the last day or so of a very strong cultural, di culturally diplomatic move from um, a retired diplomat 
called Uli Sig, who is a, a, a Swiss ambassador, an art collector um, in China, and has built up over the years one of the largest collections of contemporary art in China from the time of the, of, of the late 70s. Uh, my own engagement came with this with my brief sp spell in Hong Kong, where we were trying to persuade Uli Sig to donate or sell his collection to as, as yet unbuilt um, a, a museum in, in Hong Kong, but we knew we were in competition with Beijing and Shanghai. Only the last uh, day or so, we saw that actually Uli, um, who's a very shrewd, as you would imagine, a Swiss ambassador to be, um, has made a gift of about 165 million US dollars worth of paintings to the museum. And he sold 177 million pounds of them, 177 million US dollars. So a massive um, vote of confidence in Hong Kong as opposed to mainland China. Um, and included in that gift were 26 works by none other than Ai Weiwei, who of course has had his issues in China. And in a statement, um, uh, Uli Zig said um, that, um, that really that China needed to grow up in terms of freedom of expression. I paraphrase slightly. Um, but it was, a, it was a clever rebuke to China through the means of a gift to another country. And I think a, a wonderful piece of cultural philanthropy and diplomacy. The Chinese, of course, may take a different view. Um, they may take a longer view, saying that, well, Hong Kong in about 50 years' time will come into the uh, orbit of, of Beijing, so may well acquire the collection without having to spend a single dollar. But anyway, he's made his point. So we support engagement, but not boycott. And that goes for all our relationships, um, even for those with Israel and the Arab world. If you start picking out governments which you want to isolate, then I think at a stroke, you remove the strength of your global network. Just think, the British Council could reduce its operation from 110 countries by at least 50% if you take out all authoritarian governments or those with dubious credentials. There's certainly a way to save money, but not really to increase your impact or value to the UK and society. And it ignores the fact that our main business is as a people-to-people -people organization, not a government-to-government -government one. That's our strength. As I said, we even adopt this approach with the Israel and the Palestinian territories. We engage culturally with both peoples and thus criticize from both sides to boycott and ask to boycott the other side, pressures which we resist. I think that probably means we're in about the right position. Um, it goes back to the point that to be effective, you have to take a stand. Then if you take a principled stand, there will be those that disagree, but we will argue robustly for our position. Now, it seems a long way back to those films at the start of this talk, but it's all part of the same narrative. How do we work to find ways of understanding one another as peoples of an increasingly uncertain world without resorting to war? Is it naive to suppose that in 50 years' time we'll be conducting world affairs in a much more ordered and civilized way, that by understanding and respecting one another's traditions that we can achieve a better world harmony? I'd be naive myself if I didn't think there was an element of, well, over-optimism in that view. But set against it, what on earth is the alternative? Um, I believe in the absence or increasing unaffordability of other options, i.e. large wars are becoming very expensive, uh, probably too expensive for most countries, even, even yours, and the world overall continues in economic decline, Politicians will be obliged in the end to look to cultural relations, the creative industries, the creative economy for new solutions rather than pedestrian reruns of the old economic models, which is what we're being served up with at present. Different countries, different environments require different approaches, different solutions. From Russia through Afghanistan to Brazil, India, the Middle East, Africa, wider Europe, all of these need local knowledge, passionate commitment, and a singular global vision, all of which I believe our organization has. I believe that arts and creative industries are, in effect, the armies of the future, non-sectarian, non-armed, influential, and sustainable catalysts for growth, trust, and understanding. And this was a slide I used recently at a press conference 
I love its ironic tone. It shows artists as peace soldiers in a tranquil landscape. It's by an Egyptian artist called Nermin Haman and will be shown in London as part of a cultural Olympiad in a show called Changing Rooms. So I hope I've at least tried to demonstrate how the British Council, that very strange beast that foreigners understand better than we do, how the British Council makes its contribution to this global agenda for trust and understanding. We are emphatically not the optional nice to have. We're probably one of all of our most attractive tickets to a new sustainable global economic model. We are the arts in action. Thank you very much. Wildly inspiring and um, particularly exciting to hear that you even found a U.S. ambassador who could uh, jump on board and really see the value of what you've been up to and what you've been doing. Um, it made me think a little bit about uh, some of the work that's happening here. I think uh, Graham referenced our State Department um, has been for a number of years sending dance companies abroad and, and doing things to engage communities in emerging nations and most recently um, they've reversed the tables a bit and in fact on my desk right now is a letter from the State Department thanking us for participating in Hillary Clinton's smart power initiatives, global smart power initiatives by bringing artists from interesting places in the world to Main Street in America and we're doing that actually this weekend with, by presenting a band from Lahore, Pakistan uh, called Nuri. And um, there are, you know, you were talking about pop culture and how we're known. Um, this is a little bit of a reverse. You wouldn't expect Nuri to be sounding as American as they will, but um, we'll be doing that and we're excited to be a part of it. Um, so we have these glimmers, yet when you stand up with a slide that says, International Organization for Cultural Affairs, that's what the British Council is. I have a hard time putting my head around what the equivalent is in the US and how you would expect to collaborate in America or even a major Western country. I mean, so much of what you talked about were in emerging nations. So mm. what, what thoughts do you have about um, initiatives here. Well, obviously, I, I think the, the, I really love working with the U.S. Throughout my artistic career at the Barbican and the South Bank, we had many exchanges with the U.S. as arts organizations and dance companies, artists, filmmakers, the, the lot. Um, so I think our relationship with the, with the U.S. as terms of cultural relations has to be a rather different one, and I'm only at the beginning part of trying to work out what that is. Um, we've just started... Uh, uh, U.S. Friends of the British Council in, 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 the, in America, which hopefully will uh, stimulate some interest in new projects. But I think what we're trying to do, what we want to try and do here is maybe operate together, but outside of the U.S. and, and, and the U.K. I think there's a great deal of potential in uh, the United States and the UK teaming up on agendas to do with arts and development and civil society and arts in conflict areas that actually we could work on very much together because we see very much eye to eye, we have similar aesthetic approaches and so on. So I, I'm looking for um, support here from, I don't know where, trusts and foundations and maybe some um, enlightened politicians, I gather you, 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 you I've just met one of them just earlier this evening, but there, there may be some that, that, that can push, push the politicians, other politicians into supporting us in this endeavor, and that might be a useful way together we might be stronger than separately. So I think it's a different agenda, although of course we will exchange artistic uh, uh, experiences like the one we're doing tonight with, from the wonderful production from Scotland, but that's only part of the story. Actually, I should recognize Senator Looney is here with us today, who's been such a great champion of the festival and so many things. Senator, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Um, you talked about creative industries and collaboration, and you know, one of the things in your career, particularly at the Barbican, 
um, where you had a fairly impenetrable institution um, that through doing things with people, you turned almost single-handedly into one of the most uh, sought after destinations in Europe, both as a venue for the arts as well as a catalyst for community building. And um, it strikes me that what you're talking about doing globally really represents the microcosm <laughs> of what you did at the Barbican. What advice would you have to us as a festival? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I tried, I, I suppose the, part of the reason I feel I can get my head around an engagement with 110 different countries is, and in every art form, is that I, you're right in a way, I've, I've tried to translate a, the kind of model I did at the Barbican, which seemed big at the time, into this sort of global, um, Thing. I think the key, and I think you're to some extent, I don't think I need to give you advice because I think you're doing it here anyway, is to find something which has that, glo that global or international resonance, um, but make it of local significance and, and, and make it relevant to people locally. So it's the old local global dichotomy. And I think the fact that you're, you're inviting groups from Pakistan to come and work in your community here is, is evidence that you're basically doing it. So I, I don't think I need to give, give, you, give you any lessons here. Um, but I think maybe others in the country need to, you know, other elsewhere need to maybe pick up that example. Thanks for that. Um, I think we have some microphones in the house. If, if We'd love to get you all involved in the conversation. Anyone have any questions for Graham? We have some time. Um, I want to apologize. Could you use the, the, market, the microphone? One of the, the point that I'd like to get your views on is the notion of the interaction of individual artists or groups of artists not connected in any way with a government agency. Uh, I remember, and I, I, this concept comes from a museum that my wife and I saw in Seattle, Washington, where there was a wonderful exhibit of paintings which had been started by American or foreign uh, painters and brought to or mailed to the other country with the understanding that the artist on the other and would be able to paint on it and, and finish it in his or her fashion. And it was very interesting to see the two different approaches to the painting, but it was also very interesting to think that the relationship between those artists uh, had become a very good one. So I wonder how much effort is being put into, and, and I perhaps you t talked about that, but how much we could do in this country to facilitate not only government uh, uh, supported relationships, but individually supported. I mean, for instance, could Yale University do that? Could uh, you know somebody else do it? I mean, not Harvard would never do it, but um, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a question. Yeah. No, I think I, I, you know, there's a limit to where where uh, government certainly a limit to where government should go in the arts, um, and, the, and and there's a pr probably a limit to where we should go. And I'm very much um, inclined to the work at the British Council just to set a framework of what I want to try and achieve, and then let people get on with it. And that the the answers are very very different in, in every country. And I think um, uh, I, we've just started a a fund, a new fund, it's a re, there's no new ideas left in the world, but we started a fund that's new, but there was a similar one 20 years ago, which is called the Artist International Development Fund, which we've put together a combined pot of about a million pounds, so it's not huge, but substantial, with the Arts Councils of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and to send young artists who want to take their first steps on the international ladder and to acquire an international perspective. And it's an open access grant, so we'll decide, you know, five or 10,000 pounds, but it will just enable artists to go overseas and meet their counterparts. And I would like, uh, with another million pounds, and if there's anybody in the audience who would like to give that to me, I'd be very happy to take it, um, to make that a completely reciprocal uh, plan so that, that, that other countries can send their artists to the UK to work in a similar way. I think the artist-to-artist -artist approach is, is brilliant. That's what artists like to do. They 
frame personal relationships. And I think certainly I would have thought a, a college university like, like Yale could, could, could run its own scheme like that, which is both inbound and outbound. But we, we have to um, mutually, and this is a problem both for the US and the UK, um, sort out the artist mobility issues in terms of visas. I mean, the, one of the, the biggest obstacles to an exchange of ideas and, and arts and artists is the visa, is the issue of access to visas from certain parts of the world. And uh, we tried, I think our government has to some extent seen the light and tried to row back a bit on some of the restrictions that were placed, but we lost an awful lot of, um, uh, uh, we've off lost an awful lot of events and it's very time consuming. And, um, you know, only last week I was rung up by a, a sponsor who were bringing a Russian artist and a Nigerian artist into the UK and couldn't get the visa sorted. So I had to get on the phone to our office in Lagos and Moscow and say, go round to the embassy, kick some ass and sort it out, which we had to do. I shouldn't have to do that. What you said about the visas, what you said about the visas is very, very true. Um, but what I was interested in, or what I was describing at least, was an interaction between the artists without going to the other country. Oh, without going to the other country. All right. Well, I mean, I think that in, in, uh, uh, there are an increasing number of projects that are now happening digitally. And I've seen some work that we've been doing with India, where a dance company in the UK has been collaborating with some musicians in India and they haven't met, or they've only met at the very end of the project. And I think this, this is an extremely potent way of going forward. I mean, our, we did a major um, um, season of Dickens um, to celebrate his, whatever it was, bicentenary in February, which uh, we did a massive 24-hour Dickens marathon on, on, online. And so there were people speaking, reading Dickens to one another from Azerbaijan to Turkey to Iran to Syria to all over the world. So actually connecting people through the arts in the digital sphere and through social media is something that seems a bit exotic even now, but in five years' time it'll be the norm. I'm sure it will be. Yeah. Technology is changing a lot, mm. for sure. Anyone else have a question or comment? Thank you very much. You know, a question to you because I am so impressed with what you have achieved in your career. So if someone would come to you and say, Graham, how, you know, I want to open up North Korea, what would you do? <laughs> Uh, well, you tried to do that, and not you personally, but the U.S. sent the New York Philharmonic there, I believe, a few years ago, <laughs> which was, a, you know, one of those pieces of cultural diplomacy that is obviously quite state-driven. You, know, you know, what's the equivalent of our Rolls-Royce that we can send over there? And I imagine the audience was probably only the political elite there, and it probably has had, it's had certainly, to my mind, very little impact in terms of long-term development. Um, I think the, the, the issue about North Korea in particular is that you've got to have a partner who wants to listen. Now, the Chinese, at least, you may not like everything they're doing, but they are eager to suck up your ideas and learn, and that at least allows the basis for some sort of relationship. But if the North Koreans aren't willing to listen, I mean, the way you know, one would try and start it is by, I think, through some longer-term sort of engagement. The trouble with the New York Philharmonic Initiative, brave though it was, that it was a massive one-off party with no follow-up and legacy. And I think, you know, where we're working in, say, we're like Brazil, and we're trying to do the same in sub-Saharan Africa, is to have a festival, by all means, because people need to enjoy themselves, but work underneath at the long-term engagement through education and training and skills building. Ultimately, that's probably the only way um, with, with North Korea, because you, you certainly can't bomb them with the arts, love bomb them with the arts, I don't know. I mean, we're working now, I mean, I'm really delighted at the opening up of, of Burma now, uh, Myanmar, um, and Sang Suu Kyi's in London this week. I'm very honored I'm gonna be meeting her at a party next week. Um, and um, it's enabled us to sort of open, reopen and enlarge our office there because there's a partner now that we can engage with artistically, but it needs reciprocity, otherwise you're, you're not gonna get anywhere. I think as it relates to US though, it also needs one other thing, which is um, commitment, intent, 
and interest. I think the difference between um, what the British Council's been able to accomplish worldwide and what we have as a country is that that initiative to North Korea with the Philharmonic was privately funded, uh, was an enterprise, was not really part of uh, public policy, but was really, as you said, a, a one-off. And I think that um, in the US, the artist-artist relationship, the artist-artist collaboration, the more entrepreneurial approach is probably the more likely way that things will get done because that's just the way mm. we are. And hopefully, we can just fuel greater interest and greater commitment in our citizens because that's how we work. We demand that from our politicians. That's why we have elected officials who respond here in the way that they do. I mean, we, we do. I mean, North Korea is a very particular case. I mean, the other um, uh, uh, country with extreme difficulty is, of course, Iran. Uh, now, we're not allowed to operate in Iran. Again, we're not allowed to operate. Uh, we don't have an embassy there now. But we do have a country director, Iran, who operates out of London. And we have one or two staff who operate um, under aliases with different email addresses, virtually a bit like your point about artist to artist uh, without meeting one another. So we do work in, in Iran through, through uh, di digital means, in artistic terms, you know, trying to encourage ideas and one or two things like that. Yeah. I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, and I wanted to uh, wonder if, if you could um, tell us, um, talk to us about your um, your um, acqu your acquisition um, policies and, and strategies, um, how how you make decisions about what to bring into the collection, oh, yeah. and also um, on a sort of related question, um, you know, what constitutes um, Britishness for, for you? Because obviously we're in the you know very much a post-colonial moment, the demographics of Britain are constantly changing. And so what, what sort of parameters have you de um, um, devised? Well, that's two questions, not one question. Um, uh, the one about Britishness, this is a whole topic in itself, I think. And I don't want to give a, a very flip answer to that. I think, um, I, I, I think that very quickly on that, that because of the new, um, the devolved administrations in the UK, has made us all very much more aware of the diversity within the UK. Um, and I think it's made us much more cultural, culturally sensitive to one another, actually. So I think it's rather a good thing. Um, I, I, I think, um, and I think we, we as the British Council, which is one of the few organizations left with the word British in it, other than the BBC, because there's you know the Scots and the Welsh and the Northern Irish, so we have to operate in a very in a very culturally sensitive way, as we would in other countries, reflecting the diversity of those different cultures. But that I think is actually a strength. It makes it sometimes more difficult, but it's a strength. Um, that's only a very short answer to what's actually an extremely complex. Um, in terms of the British Council collection. Um, uh, the short answer is we don't have an acquisitions policy at the moment because um, earlier iterations of the administration rather eroded the funding for the collection. But I'm about to make a case to my uh, executive board and trustees for a massive reinvestment in the collection um, and, and also looking for partners. And there may be partners here in the US, indeed in this building, who might be interested in, in sharing that sort of ambition to, to grow, to, to regrow the collection and expand it. Um, and, and also to deploy it in different ways around the world. Um, so I think it's the beginning of quite an exciting time. And I'm hoping we'll also be able, for those of you familiar with the sort of detail of British polit cultural politics, we're going to align ourselves much more closely with the Arts Council, with Arts Council England, who also have a major collection, and see what we can do together. Not merging the collections, but working together, because any money we can save in support services, we can put into the art. Thank you. With that, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Graham. What, what an intriguing talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.